You're listening to Let's Talk AI. Good day. Welcome to Let's Talk AI. Today's guest is Joel Blitt, Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Waterloo. Welcome, Joel. Thanks, Harold. It's great to be here. Awesome. So, Joel, we're going to jump right in and uh, get you to tell us a bit about your background. How did you uh, how, did, how did you come to University of Waterloo? Well, it's uh, in, in some ways it's it's uh, my backyard. I grew up in Toronto, and so this is uh, it's nice. I'm I'm close to home again. But of course, to get here, I I went through many different places, lived in different countries, um, and and you know eventually made my way back here. Uh, so my um, my undergrad was in engineering. It was at the University of Toronto. Um, I, I completed that and then went on to do a master's uh, here at Waterloo, actually. Uh, so another reason why this is sort of a, a homecoming. Uh, so I, I got a master's here in computer engineering. Uh, when I was done that, uh, oddly enough, I decided I wanted to go into the business world. So I went into um, into strategy consulting. I worked there for a couple of years, um, lived in Australia for, for some of my engagements, which, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then I decided to go to business school. And so I, I got an MBA from INSEAD in France, uh, just outside of Paris. Uh, through my MBA, I, I realized that I really liked economics because economics is a field that allows you to study all sorts of different areas from different perspectives. Uh, and one of the nice things about economics is that you use very similar tools to the tools that I had learned in engineering. So, uh, it, you know, you're basically using math, but instead of applying the math to technical systems, you're applying the math to social systems. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed economics and decided that I would go into economics from there. So I went and got a, a, a master's from Western. And from there, I went on to do a PhD at the University of Toronto. Excellent. Okay, so you, you touched on the area of innovation, and that looks to be the, the focus area. So how is AI, use of AI, affecting innovation in today's world? Well, I think AI is, is going to be affecting all sorts of different areas. And, and I think we've reached an inflection point with ChatGPT. I think, uh, you know, we there's 100 million users in, in two months, uh, and we're only going to see things get faster and, and better and, and more adoption over time. Um, ChatGPT, like, you know, it, it's a tool uh, and it's a tool that fundamentally is allowing us to uh, retrieve lots of information, to synthesize it and also to generate content. And so really it's, it's doing all, all three of those functions at once. Um, one way that we can think about innovation is that innovation is just a recombination of existing ideas into new groups of ideas that generate some value. Uh, and so from that perspective, ChatGPT is really good at going out there, retrieving lots of different ideas and synthesizing them, grouping them into new groups to create something new. So we might think that uh, it, it might be really useful. It might propose lots of new ideas, lots of new uses. Uh, but of course, most of them, uh, if anyone has that has used ChatGPT can see that most of those uses are going to be pretty useless. Uh, and so that's where we really need the humans. So the humans are still, I think, for a long time going to be better at the judgment part. They're going to see what's coming out of ChatGPT and, and decide what is useful, what is not. Uh, you know, to, to give you a very simple example, uh, we're in the process of, of dreaming up what an innovation policy institute might look like. And one of the things that we wanted to do was come up with ideas for names. And so I asked ChatGPT, I gave it a description of what the institute's going to do. And I said, come up with some names. And uh, it came up with about 20 different names. Truth be told, most of them were terrible. But at the very least, it, it, it was a starting point that we could then iterate over. It gave us lots of ideas for, for names. And it was actually really useful. So I think that's where it's going to help innovation. It's going to allow, it's going to facilitate brainstorming, coming up with lots of ideas. But I think humans will always, at least for, for, you know, for a long time still, have a really important uh, role to play in innovation. You know, interesting. I, respectfully, you know, innovation is a topic that seems to be all over the areas of uh, science and math. But coming back to economics, uh, where do you see innovation fitting in that field? Is it changing our perspective? Is it changing how we're looking at finance of things? How is the innovation and economics fitting together in your in your eyes? So I think, uh, you know, as economists, we're trying to understand what drives innovation, how to promote innovation, um, 
what is the technological trajectory of, of technology? What is the impact of technology on society? We're asking all of these, these different questions. Um, so, so for example, you know, one question might be around policy. If we want to increase the amount of innovation, uh, what are the sorts of policies that we need to put in place? Uh, and so, of course, I, I do some work in that area. Uh, another critical question is, well, we know that AI is on the horizon. It's, it's here, but you know, it's, it's, it's going to be increasing its impact. So how do we expect the, the diffusion of a technology like, like AI to happen in society? And of course, we can ask a similar question for any other disruptive technology. So there's, there's, there's all of that. Uh, and then, of course, we can ask, okay, what's going to be the impact uh, of AI as it gets deployed? Uh, and so what's going to be the impact on business and how should businesses be thinking about this? But what's going to be the impact on society and, and the future of work? And, and are people going to lose their jobs? Is it, is it going to create inequality? These are you know, all questions that economists uh, and, and management people are tackling around innovation. So the, the Internet was a profound influence on us life-wise. And you talked about GPT earlier. Is that re-leveling the playing field now in some kind of sense? Uh, you know, some people thought they had a competitive insight or stuff. I want to just del delve in a little bit more on chat GPT. Like, how do you see that affecting us for small companies? Can they compete now better or are they advantaged against, uh, disadvantaged against large companies? That's a good question. I actually hadn't thought of it from that perspective. Um, well, I, you know, to the extent that it allows small companies to have access to, uh, you know, data and, and other, and, and it does have the potential to uh, be a democratic factor. Absolutely. I think it is possible that uh, it's a tool that maybe some of the bigger firms already had through, through other means and maybe smaller firms did not. Um, again, ChatGPT fundamentally is about, it, it, it's a tool that allows you to get access to data, synthesize it, and generate new content. Uh, to the extent that we think that bigger firms had an advantage in that, and now this is allowing smaller firms to also compete in those areas, then it might uh, level the, the playing field a little bit. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think we're going to have to to wait and see. It's it's not obvious to me how it's going to shake out. Okay, you talked about the social side here. And I'm, we've been focused a lot that this whole wave of, of innovation, almost like a tsunami that's coming from AI in general, not just a chat GPT scenario. How are younger students, even from a high school and elementary level, how are they going to get their head around this and their parents so that this becomes a, an area of study or a field of interest for them? How can we help them? Well, I mean, I so, so I think there's, there's two different pieces here. One is... Uh, you know, AI is not, not going to go away anytime soon and there's going to be ongoing developments and we have to make sure that we are creating a talented workforce that can advance these tools, do research in these areas and become experts in AI. So, so that's one piece. The other piece, though, is that it's also going to be a tool that society is going to have to learn to leverage. And so we have to make sure that it's not just, the re not just that we have enough researchers in this area, but that we also have people that know about these technologies, know how to use it, know how to leverage it, et cetera. And this goes, I think, all the way, as, as you're mentioning, uh, from the schools all the way to executives, right? And so we want to make sure that our students in the schools are getting access to these technologies and are using them. For example, around ChatGPT, there's a lot of discussion as to whether they should be banned altogether. Um, I think that's an, an absolutely terrible idea. Uh, if you ban ChatGPT, our students are not going to get access to the technology that they're going to be expected to be using when they're in the labor force. Uh, the other nice reason not to ban ChatGPT is that it's going to force a fundamental rethink of the way that we're teaching, because obviously some of the, you know, some of the assignments that students had, they're not going to be able to do easily on ChatGPT. So we're going to have to uh, maybe modify the way we teach and maybe focus on higher order tasks, you know, things like critical thinking, et cetera. So, you know, I, I, I think we have to make sure that these tools are getting in the hands of our kids in school. There has to be more outreach. There has to be more uh, openness to these technologies at all levels. I'd say it's the same thing in university. We also need to make sure that society at large is aware of these tools and all the benefits that, they, that, that it can bring. 
So we need to be doing a lot more sort of societal outreach. I think that's one of the roles that our institute here could be playing. Uh, and then the, the last thing, of course, is we need to make sure that we're, our executives also know about these technologies and, and what they can do with them. Um, so what exactly, how should executives think about AI? It, it, it can't just be some nebulous technology. They need to be able to wrap their heads around what is it? How does it change the game? What, what does it make possible? And therefore, is this something that I should be adopting for my firm as quickly as possible? Um, not to diverge too much from your question, but you know, in Canada, we have a pretty serious innovation productivity gap. Uh, our, our firms are not known in general for adopting technology as quickly as, as they should. Uh, and AI obviously is one of the key technologies that's coming down the line. And so I think from a, from a Canadian perspective, one of the key questions we need to be asking is, how do we encourage our firms to adopt AI as quickly and, and fully as possible? Because it is a wave of the future. This is what we're going to have to do as, as a country to become more productive and therefore to increase our standard, our standard of living in the long run. Okay, so to quote a, a very famous econo economist, Peter Drucker, he said it's every company's and really even at a personal level, responsibility to manage the uncertain future. You know, and I think that's something that AI can help to do. Could you elaborate on that thought? So that AI, that, that every company's, uh, every company has a responsibility to manage their uncertain future because AI is considered to be, you know, helping with predictions and, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, so what's your thoughts about that? Well, I, I, I do think of AI fundamentally as a prediction tool, uh, and and so it, you know if i'm if i'm a business person executive i'd be thinking about where am i doing prediction tasks and can i replace those prediction tasks with ai that it would it be able to do it cheaper faster better um i'm not sure ai is now at the point where it can you know do a prediction of where the future is heading i like that's not the kind of prediction that that you know i think ai is strong at right now AI, I think, is very strong at predicting, say, who is more likely to default on a loan. Uh, it's very good at predicting, maybe if you're a, a, an insurance company, who is likely to have a car accident, lots of things like that. But, you know, trying to predict the, the future of, of business or something like that, I, I think, is still beyond uh, what AI can do. Uh, having said that, you know, to some extent, that's the kind of work that I do myself. Right. So I try and think about, OK, so we've got disruptive technologies like AI. There's others, of course, like quantum technologies, et cetera. And the question is, how should we expect these technologies to evolve over time? Uh, what's going to be the adoption path? What should firms expect is going to happen in their different industries? Um, and the reality is. If you look at these general purpose technologies, technologies that are this disruptive, they tend to sort of follow a, always a similar path. Uh, and so I always talk about three phases of adoption. And in the first phase, as I was saying, uh, the, the companies just look at their tasks and they see, okay, if I keep everything the same, but where am I doing, for example, for talking about AI, where am I doing a prediction task? And therefore I can get rid of that task the way it's being done right now. So maybe it's, it's humans that are predicting the risk of default of, of a potential client. Uh, can I do that better with AI? Right. And so phase one, these firms are going to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to get rid of these individuals doing this. I'm just going to put in an AI algorithm. That's going to get the firm sort of uh, certain gains and benefits, but it's only going to take them so far because in order to really get the benefits and, you know, from AI and other technologies, you have to fundamentally rethink the way you're doing business to fully take advantage of the technology. So, for example, imagine that uh, prediction got so good, right? So we had so much data and AI got so good at predicting that you, you're, um, you're, you're a retailer, maybe like Loblaws or something like that, and you now can predict with extreme accuracy when people are going to need milk and bread and any other uh, grocery item. That might make you fundamentally change the way you do business. Instead of having brick and mortar stores all, all over the place where people can go shopping, you might instead have a truck that is driving around the neighborhoods and is delivering proactively all of these different goods because you know 
with 98% probability when different individuals are going to want the milk, the bread, et cetera. So fundamentally, you'd be rethinking the way you do your business. Phase three, by the way, is in an entirely different beast. This is where this technology combines with entirely other technologies to create entirely new paradigms. And so, of course, it's very hard for us to predict what that's going to be. I mean, I, I could give you some examples of what I think, but, um, but going back to your original question, you know, th this kind of study, this, this thinking about previous historical technologies and therefore what we might expect from AI, I think can really help firms sort of map out their trajectory of how they should be adopting these technologies and how they should be thinking strategically about how they can improve their business and, and gain comparative advantage. Okay, well, you've, you've foreshadowed us. You've teased us with the ideas about the third from your perspective. Could you elaborate then? Well, I, I mean, so the third, you know, how is AI going to combine with other technologies? That's the hardest. I mean, that, you know, if, if anyone knew you'd create a business in that area uh, and, uh, you know, it, it would be the next Google or, or the next uh, Amazon. So, so obviously it's very hard. But, you know, one area where uh, at least I see technologies combining is around collaborative robots. Right. And so robotics itself is improving fairly quickly. We're getting robots that are more flexible, that are smaller, that can, uh, you know, navigate everyday context. Uh, and of course, AI is going to combine with that mechanical ability of robots to give them the ability to, to, to navigate those everyday contexts without conflicting with humans. They're going to help them make the right decisions. And the third piece of technology that's coming that's coming in to allow collaborative robots is uh, connectivity, right? So 5G, 6G, uh, real-time connectivity with low latency. So I, I think these three technologies, robotics, AI, and, uh, you know, 6G, 5G, 6G, are going to be coming together to really create the next wave of robots, collaborative robots, that are going to be able to embed themselves in everyday situations and be flexible and therefore we're going to be able to truly do all sorts of things. So again, one way of thinking about this is AI really is about cognitive tasks uh, and robots are about doing mechanical tasks. When you combine both those things in one, you truly have something that will fundamentally change the world. Okay. This is fascinating. Uh, I want to go, I want to roll up the sleeves a little bit on this. How do you do this? What's a day in the life of Joel in doing this? How, how do you go about trying to figure this stuff out? Well, m most of what I do is I, I find data sets and I analyze data sets to try and draw insights. Uh, and so, you know, I'd, I'd say that's probably 80% of the work that I do. Um, but the other thing I do is I, I read a lot. I, I look at, uh, I read about the history of past technologies and I try and sort of glean insights from that and see how that might apply to future technologies like AI, like quantum technologies. Uh, and so, you know, that is, is, is maybe not the typical kind of work that I do, because again, my typical work is working with data. Uh, but I, you know, I, I find it really fascinating because what you're really doing is reading, thinking, and then trying to, to sort of synthesize what you've learned to try and make predictions about the future. It's a lot less scientific uh, than most of my work, but, but I do find it really interesting. Okay, so I'm going to go back to where you started earlier about policy and things like that. You're an advisor with various committees on AI, innovation policy, or innovation policy. And again, how does that play out? Because this is a, a little bit of an intangible area. So, so, so you're, are, are you asking for concrete examples? Well, no, I'm just kind of, of where... asking, how do you give advice to them on AI policy? How do you open their minds uh, on, you know, what, I, I hate to use the word should, or, you know, what they might want to consider, uh, you know, to help grow this whole space of innovation? It, most of the advice tends to be not centered on AI itself. It tends to be centered on how do we promote innovation? Uh, as, as I was mentioning, Canada has an innovation productivity gap. So how do we begin to address this? And unfortunately, there isn't one, you know, magic silver bullet. It really is going to take a little bit of adjusting our systems on a whole bunch of different dimensions. And so let me just mention some of these different tools in our toolkit for promoting innovation. 
so, you know, one of them that, that is often talked about might be immigration and skilled immigration. The idea here would be to bring in lots of skilled immigrants in specific areas that might be able to, um, you know, help conduct lots of research in the area. Uh, truth be told, Canada has not had, um, contrary to popular belief, by the way, Canada has not had tremendous success in this area, at least not compared to the U.S. Uh, I've written a paper about that with my colleague, Mikhail Skuderud. Um, but that is certainly something that, that we could be doing better. By the way, the reason why we haven't had that much success is that many of the engineers that immigrate to Canada end up not finding jobs in their field. And so how can we help them find jobs in their field so that they do have this impact we're looking for? Other parts are how do we train more engineers and specifically more engineers in key sectors like artificial intelligence? That's another key question. Another key question is around intellectual property rights. So uh, is it the case that patents stimulate more innovation or are they actually stifling innovation? Uh, you know, I myself sit mostly in, in the latter camp. I think, uh, I think patents have become too strong and they're mostly stifling innovation. So again, reforms in these areas can help uh, kickstart innovation. There's things like uh, research grants that the that uh, that governments can put forward, both to universities but also to to industry. Uh, there's things like the shreds, so so having um, uh, having tax credits, right? So that can also incentivize more in, uh, innovation by firms. So there's there's many many different tools. I mean, I could I could give you a whole bunch more. Um, the question is, how do you move the needle by adjusting all of these different levers in a way that is, is going to make us have uh, forward progress? Maybe the last thing I want to mention is, you know, one other tool that, that maybe we don't use as much as, as we could is there are going to be some very important, very disruptive technologies. And again, I think AI is the obvious one, at least for me. And if Canada can gain a lead in those technologies, then it might be able to kickstart lots of other complementary things around innovation. Uh, the reason is that these technologies are general purpose technologies. They tend not to be focused in one sector, but they, they impact lots of different sectors. And so maybe something else that Canada could do is really make a huge investment in one or two key areas. Maybe one of them might be AI. Uh, and, and those investments could kick, make us leaders in that area and kickstart innovation in surrounding sectors as well. Well, I'm going to just, that's a great thought to think about. This is some uh, prompting thought for our, our leaders here in Canada. And I'm going to wrap it up there today. I uh, appreciate your time on Let's Talk AI. You brought a great uh, mind-opening conversation about innovation in AI. And uh, thanks again for being here today. Thanks. It was great to be here, Harold. Awesome.